Apple is notoriously secretive about most things that go on behind closed Cupertino doors, but this is especially true when it comes to their AI and self-driving car research. But our guest today wrote about a secret meeting with the new head of Apple's machine learning team, Russ Salakudinov, and other Apple employees. Dave Gershgarn from Quartz is here to talk about some of the topics that Apple talked about in that meeting. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So what was the purpose of this invite-only meeting? So basically what it seemed like was Apple wanted to hold this little lunch to talk with a lot of people from the machine learning, artificial intelligence community and just kind of catch them up to speed. So people from Google, startups, Microsoft, you name it, um, people were there to kind of hear about what's been going on behind closed doors. And I think Apple wanted to keep some of it kind of on the, on the hush. Um, it was invite only. They didn't really tell any press about it. Um, the, the news kind of first leaked when somebody tweeted that, that Apple was going to start publishing uh, their work, and then a few other people started tweeting about it. Um, but what, what also happened inside the meeting was Apple gave a pretty deep dive on a lot of the other projects that they've been working on. Uh, some notable things are like how they're going to actually make decisions based on your health data, um, detection of, of like LIDAR and, and how to make, how to track something that moves in a 3D space. Um, and even, I guess, like the simple things like making Siri better. And you talked about how they're, they're actually going to be able to make neural networks smaller, which makes sense for Apple because they um, sell mobile phones and small devices. Um, did, did, they, did the slides that you had access to give you any idea of how they would make neural networks smaller than they already are? Yeah, so this is actually fascinating, and, and it's something that I, I think is going to kind of really catch on for a, a few different reasons. So th the way that they, they do this is they have this kind of large, very robust neural network where it's, it's something um, – that they, they feed it a lot of data, maybe, you know, anonymized user data. I, I, on one of the other slides, they say that they, they use a 2.2 million images, which is almost double kind of like standard image recognition um, database. And they have this big, huge thing, but it's way too big to put on the phone. So what they do is they um, have a, a tiny network just kind of ask it questions and they kind of what would you do in this situation what would you do in this situation um and that way it kind of learns the way that the larger network would make a decision without needing all that data and what's also cool about that is it obscures the data that the um that the larger network actually learned in, in the first place um because there have been a, attacks that kind of are able to figure out the training data if it's not obscured. Um, so a different way to think about it is say you have a friend and you want to buy them a clothes for Christmas and you want to know their, their, their taste in clothes. So you ask them, how do you like this scarf? And you show them a scarf and they're like, oh, it's all right. And then you say, how do you like these pants? And they say, oh, I love those pants. And then you ask them all these quite different questions about clothes. You have a knowledge of what they would do in certain situations and how they would buy clothes, but you don't have access to anything else that they know besides that. Or, and you also don't have access to the, the experiences that made them like, you know, blue jeans over khakis or something like that. So that's a way of to think about like that, that kind of like disembodied knowledge um, that's make that, that that's just encapsulated in a tiny neural network that's able to run on a phone way faster. Hmm. Right. And so Apple's big on like on the de on the device. So maybe it would even be able yeah. to run in our AirPods if we ever get them and it could I could keep it in my <laughs> It'll never happen. Have, <laughs> we'll never get it. Yeah, them. if we ever get them. <laughs> if we ever we'll get see. them then it could like, you know, just feed me questions all the time and <laughs> in my daily life oh. I could <laughs> talk to people. Yeah. It so they, they basically just want to make these things as small as possible because any nothing like they don't want to put it on iCloud. They don't want to have it on ser the servers. Although there there was a slide about the the servers as well, where they might be building their own GPUs to run deep learning uh, processes because they kind of showed um, these like Apple GPUs against Amazon Web Services, and it ran like twice as fast with a third of the GPUs. And it's this really interesting thing that like what, like Apple is kind of making their own kind of standalone AI outfit. And they've been doing it very much in the shadows, um, but it, it could emerge that they've been right all along and, and we were wrong to underestimate them. But I'm sure that that's also what they want me to be saying right now. So it, it's kind of tough to gauge with Apple because they've always been so secretive. 
and um, and now they're just starting to, to come out a little bit. That uh, really ties right into kind of my main question here, and we've we've asked it on the show, or we've discussed it on the show a few times in the past, because it seems like more and more companies like Apple, who we're so used to seeing them be so secretive about the things that they haven't released yet, or the th- you know the the machinations of everything that happens behind the scenes, they're starting to really kind of open up aspects of their research when it comes to AI specifically. Uh, what do they gain by doing this? I mean, is it just this greater kind of base of knowledge without giving way too much that they all benefit from? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is talent. They they recognize that there are only maybe a dozen schools in the U.S. that are putting out like top tier, cream of the crop 1% um, machine learning researchers, and they need access to that. And, and you know, if, you, if these people are looking at companies that they're going to go to, they kind of have their pick if they're really good. So they can go to Google and they have a open access to publish and they can talk with their friends about their research and like they can kind of collaborate and make this great future that people want from AI. And going to work with Apple has traditionally been like, all right, you get a new job, but you can't go to the bar and talk with your friends anymore. Like you can't, um, you know, discuss your research. You can't collaborate with other people. Um, and I think that's also why, why, why research outfits like OpenAI has, have attracted some, some really, um, really good talent in AI is because they are – uh, saying that you can work with everyone, you know, anybody who wants to work with, with them is kind of, you know, it's open game. They, they work with Google all the time. Um, there's a lot of collaboration. They have open, you know, collaboration with NVIDIA. They're funded by, I think, uh, a bunch of different uh, companies. So it, openness is very much kind of like the name of the game right now. And Apple is kind of catching up and they're saying that we can't be big players. We can't recruit top level talent if we don't kind of play this game. Um, and it's actually, I think it's awesome because it's something where like these researchers are winning this, this war. They, it, it's very much a priority to them that this that research happens in the open. Um, and it happens in a way that's accountable. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a really smart move for Apple, but it's also kind of a, a good thing for the, the entire ecosystem of, of people who are making AI, designing systems around it, um, and we don't know, like they haven't published anything. It'll probably be few and far between um, what they do publish. But uh, the fact that they're coming to the table, I think does mean a lot. Yeah. And so their new head of machine learning, uh, Russ Salakudinov, he's from Carnegie Mellon. So, I mean, he's an yeah. academic researcher. Do you think he, him at the helm will change their willingness to share and publish more? Totally. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something that he kind of brought on entirely. I mean, the timing is kind of suspect for that. Um, he's only been there for a few months, and it, it seems that they kind of brought him on um, to tell them how they can get ahead and how they can um, kind of keep up with, if not lead the pack in, in recruiting top bull talent. Because it's not like people don't want to work for Apple, um, but it's just it, it's a really difficult decision to make to kind of like give up a lot of professional connections. And it, when I've spoken to AI researchers in the past, I mean, a lot of them will say that, you know, we do have friends at Apple and we talk to them kind of like, you know, on the hush hush and we kind of know what's going on there, but it's a big difference between being able to talk at a, you know, at a bar versus collaborate on something that that's, you know, meaningful and you can, that creates value for the community and both companies. So they also talked about in the slides, there's information about machine learning and LIDAR, uh, you know, the technology yeah. in self-driving cars. Does that uh, yeah. make you think that they do have a car in the works? It's one of those things where it's like, well, it's, I don't know, like how many things are, is that going to do that they're going to use LIDAR for? Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, and there are pictures of little cars, like it's, it's very stock already. Um, but, you know, my, my sources there were like, they didn't say the word car, they didn't say the word automotive, don't, don't infer anything from this. Um, but I mean, you can infer a, a little bit. Like, the iPhone doesn't have a LiDAR sensor on it. The iPhone <laughs> doesn't. My MacBook doesn't. <laughs> Maybe well, self-driving AirPods that could drive themselves oh, right into your ears. I like that. That's, that's the delay. They're, they've <laughs> yeah. got LiDAR in it, so you can just close your eyes and Siri will direct you around. It's perfect. <laughs> Okay, well, one last question before we let you go. I, uh, you also had a piece in Quartz today about Boston Dynamic robot dogs that might be delivering your items to your home. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Totally. So I think Boston Dynamics is really just looking for 
they're, they're just throwing stuff on the wall. And they're like, all right, what are we going to do with these robots? They're like incredibly robust. They can walk on anything. Um, they're not like super, they, they're not backed by a lot of AI right now. Like a lot of it's kind of uh, pre-programmed, but they are thinking about like what, what we're going to do. Like we have something that can grasp a door handle and turn it and, you know, maybe knock on a door, throw a package somewhere. And, um, it, they haven't really worked for military uses. They they haven't successfully been able to sell the company what they were trying to do. Um, and there's so they're they're seeing hey maybe we'll deliver them. But there's a little bit of like a weird uh, friction in the idea that you're going to use like a million dollar machine to deliver a pizza or like a, a water bottle. Um, it's it's much easier to just put a little like robot with four wheels and just let it. Go. So um, it would be awesome. Like I personally would love to have the Boston Dynamics robot kind of like walk up and I can give it a little high five and it's cool head hand thing and then it'll give me my pizza. But um, realistically, I don't know if it's going to happen. But th the guy said it. That the CEO of the company was said that this is like a, a possibility. Um, probably a small one. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you have the best title ever, uh, Artificial Intelligence Reporter. Like, it, it sort of implies, so that's why we really wanted to have you on to see that you were real and not just an I AI. <laughs> yes, my first few days, everyone was like, it would come up to me like, all right, robot or not, and I, I am real. <laughs> So, uh, so you can have that, that, that assurance. Awesome. Well, you can find Dave's work uh, about robots and AI at QZ.com, at Quartz, and Dave Gershgorn Gorn on Twitter. Thanks so much for coming on. Great. Thank Thanks you, Dave. Me. Have a great night. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. You